They say that the, uh, the sense of smell has the greatest potential to arouse a variety of emotions. Some say it's the last thing to go. You ever uh, remember how you, you go by, you're driving by and you smell some freshly cut grass or hay, brings you back to another time, another period, or bacon, cooking, makes you nostalgic for the food that your mom used to make maybe when you were young. Certain smells you know, denote certain places or experiences. Uh, Great Lakes Christian College in uh, uh, Ontario, Canada, uh, I, I, they could bring me there blindfolded and, and bring me into the building and I know I would be at Great Lakes Christian College in Beamsville, Ontario, just by the smell. It's because they use a certain detergent to wash the floors there and that has a smell that I've never smelled anywhere else. So I smell that every time I go back there for whatever reason, that smell you know, brings me back. Psychologists tell us that the sense of smell plays an important role in human sexuality and I can believe it. I mean, perfume companies spend millions and millions of dollars trying to create you know, a mix of ingredients to produce fragrances that will be sold to enhance one's image or to uh, create mystery or desirability, all from, all from smell. So it's quite natural, therefore, that the Bible uses the experience of smell to create certain images and to teach certain lessons. For example, in Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, after the great flood had cleansed the earth of sin, Noah offered a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. And the Bible says that God smelled the soothing aroma, denoting that the violence and sin were replaced by peace and righteousness. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, Paul uses this imagery as well, calling the gift sent to him by a church you know, to help him out, a gift of money that was sent to help him out. He says it was a fragrant aroma. Imagine, again, suggesting that their gift was like a sweet smelling thing, pleasant to experience. And so this brings me to Ephesians chapter five. In Ephesians chapter five, Paul uses the very same analogy of smell to describe two things. First, he describes the idea of smell to, um, to point out how pleasing the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf was to God. Let's read Galatians 5.1.2 and read it in his own words. He says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And so he describes the offering of Jesus as a fragrant aroma to the Father. And he also describes how pleasing the life of one who imitates Christ is to God. And if you're going to do a study from verse three in Galatians chapter five all the way to the end of the chapter, uh, he describes the idea that our life, our death, and our resurrection will also be like a fragrant aroma that is lifted up to God. So I believe that being pleasing to God is very important to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want to be pleasing. I wonder if how many prayers went up this weekend that said to a certain effect, Lord, help me to do what you want me to do. Lord, help me to be the kind of person you want me to be. Or you could have said, Lord, let my life be a fragrant aroma to you, acceptable in your sight. And so I believe that being pleasant and pleasing to God is very important. So this afternoon, I'd like to share with you some of the ingredients necessary to create the aroma of Christ that is so pleasing to God. So in Ephesians chapter five and in chapter six, Paul describes four ingredients that creates the aroma of Christ. Ingredient number one, he says, is purity. 
purity. In verse three and four, Paul describes the first essential ingredient in order to produce the aroma of Christ in our lives, and that is personal purity. Purity means cleanliness, the absence of any foreign matter in the ingredient. And Paul lists the type of things that need to be removed from our lives as Christians in order for our lives to be pure. So let's read verse three. He says, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. What's he talking about? He's talking about improper sexual activity, including lasciviousness, you know, pornography, voyeurism. He talks about greed, you know, never having enough, materialism, swearing, dirty jokes, bad language, nasty and derogatory remarks, lewd behavior and speech. And I, I, you know, I don't want to pick something or someone out to give you an example of that, you know, to criticize a person, but one person that goes out of their way to do that, for example, in the, in the media, you ever heard of Howard Stern? He used to have a TV program, radio pro. Howard Stern you know, would go out of his way to make sure that his programs were filled with lewd behavior and he'd parade sexual freaks you know, as entertainment. That's what Paul is talking about, this kind of behavior. He reminds them that it is for this kind of impurity that God punishes people. And it's amazing, apostles don't usually say this. You know, the Lord says that, verily, verily, right? But apostles don't, they don't usually take that stance. But here, Paul does. He says, make no mistake, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It is because of this kind of behavior that God will punish. Don't let anyone tell you, ah, you're a prude, ah, come on, get with the, you know, get with the program, it's modern times, you know, and so on and so on. This is all good. You know. All the people we admire promote all kinds of sexual impurity, but we admire them. They're clean, they're well-dressed, they're, they're applauded, they're given rewards and trophies and money and adulation, and we think, yeah, what's, what's so bad? But Paul says, but Paul says, don't let anyone fool you. It's because of this type of behavior that God will bring punishment. And then in verses seven to 14, he continues by encouraging Christians not only to avoid such behavior, but not to tolerate it in others and to expose it as evil to the world. Christians not only have a right to denounce what is immoral and impure in this world, they have a responsibility to do so. So ingredient number one, if you want to create that aroma that is pleasing to God, purity. And how do you do it? You don't actually create it out of nothing, you just take things out that are you know, spoiling what you already are as a Christian. Ingredient number two, he says, is spirituality. The second ingredient necessary to produce the aroma of Christ, spirituality. Let's pick it up in verse 15, shall we? Chapter five. He says, therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So here, Paul compares the feature of worldly, godless living to a spiritual lifestyle. In the life without reference to God or spiritual things, 
Men are careless in their ways. They don't seek after spiritual wisdom. They, they, they fail to recognize that the time is short and judgment is coming. Their greatest pleasure is to waste their life and time with parties and pleasure and drunkenness. And their favorite state of mind is anything, anything at all that has nothing to do with God. That's what they're shooting for. And Paul is saying that's, that's the state of the world. That's how worldly people live. They don't, they don't understand what's, what's about to take place in a few short years or a few short seconds of their lives. But, he says, the follower of Christ, this person, this woman, this man, is spiritual in nature and in purpose. He or she is filled with the Spirit and because of this has wisdom and knowledge of things that come from above, not just things that come from below. Their time is not wasted on foolish activities but invested in spirit-filled things like praise and prayer and thanksgiving. And don't get me wrong, we can't do that seven days a week. We got to work, we got to sleep, we got to take care of the kids, we got to go grocery shopping, fix the porch, bring the car to the... Well, uh, yeah, we got life. Life happens and it sucks up most of the time. But the spiritual man, the spiritual woman, will purposefully carve out a piece of that time and set it aside for their spiritual well-being. You have to do it willingly. It doesn't happen. You know, uh, uh, everything else will take over your time. Everything else demands your time, whatever that is. You have to actually carve the time out to make the time for God. Like we have made the time today to be here, regardless of the weather and what we had to do and so on and so forth, we made the time. You had to make the time. And their fellowship, speaking of those with the Spirit, their fellowship and their relationship is not in lust, not in competition with one another like in the world, but in humility and submission, which is of the Spirit. We don't compete with each other to please God. We cooperate with each other to please God. We help one another. We bear each other's burdens. We encourage one another. We lift each other in order to be pleasing to God. That's the spirit that exists in this place. You know, some people complain that you know, church activities you know, is cutting into their lifestyle or limiting what they can do. Yeah, <laughs> of course it does. Of course it does. So? They don't realize that church activity is real life. And the rest of our hobbies here on earth are just temporary. No football in heaven, I hate to say. No March Madness in heaven. None of that. There isn't any of that. We have better things to do. We will be better people at that time. And so spirituality means that a person knows the difference between what is real and eternal and what is just passing and of this world. Remember the Lord said, you know, we, we live in the world so we have to be part of this world. And part of this world includes eating, sleeping, working, entertainment, leisure time, sports, activities. Yes, all of those things. But all of those things never forgetting that those are the temporary things. And the things we're doing here today, these things have to do with the eternal things. That's why they may not take up as much time as the other things, but they are a stronger priority. And the spiritual person understands that idea. So we want to create the aroma of Christ, purity, especially sexual purity. Spirituality, ingredient number three, ordered living. Ordered living in verses 22 to 25. Let's pick it up there, five, verse 22. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands 
in everything. And then in chapter six, uh, beginning in verse one, he says, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on this earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good, that each, uh, good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Ingredient number three, an ordered life. You cannot produce the aroma of Christ without orderly living. And Paul describes the proper order of the six main relationships in one's life. First one, wives need to be in submission to their husbands. Second one, husbands need to love their wives as Christ loved the church, which means sacrificial love. Third, children need to obey their parents. Fourth, parents need to lead their children tenderly. Fifth, employees need to be honest and profitable to your employers. And sixth, employers need to be fair with their employees. The presence of Christ is easily seen by the orderliness in our lives. And Christ requires this especially in the everyday affairs of life as we deal with family and work. And why? Why? because His presence must be recognizable in our everyday family and work life, not just church life. An orderly life is a greater witness for our Christianity than being at church on Sunday mornings, because unbelievers don't come to church, but they see you in your marriage, and they see you at work, and they see how you treat your family, and they see what kind of employee you are, and they see what kind of boss you are, and that's how they judge you, not how well you lead singing, how well you pray, if you're in Sunday school, they don't see that. They see your normal everyday life and they judge by that life. And so we need purity, spirituality, an ordered life, and then ingredient number four, perseverance. The final ingredient to produce the aroma of Christ, perseverance. In chapter six, verses 10 to 20, Paul describes what perseverance is, and I just want to go through these with you. In verse 10, chapter six, he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. So what is perseverance? First of all, it's being strong in the Lord. Not everybody's strong in the Lord. You might be in the Lord, but maybe you're weak in the Lord. You're unsure in the Lord. You're tentative in the Lord. He's saying be strong in the Lord. Not wavering in where you stand and what you believe. Not a situation where others have some sort of doubt about your commitment. Okay, is she going to show up or not? It, it, you know, I'm going to give this thing to this person. They said, they promised that they would get it done, but you know what? It's 50-50 if they're actually going to get it done or not. Or it's 50-50 if they're going to remember to do it. Or it's 50-50 if they're even going to do it properly or not. Or if I call them for help, I know 100% that I can count on them being strong in the Lord. Nobody has a doubt about your commitment. You exude faith and confidence, the willingness to do the right thing and say the right thing and think the right thing. In other words, people can count on you to react like a Christian every time. And you're one of these people that when someone is planning something low or something dirty or something sketchy, they won't ask you to join because they know, they know what your answer will be. 
I remember when I was a young Christian, just had been baptized just a couple of months and I was working at a place at a company and we were in the lunchroom and you know how it is, people talking, tables, back and forth, whatever. And one table, and it was women as a matter of fact, had a, you know, a magazine at Playboy or Playgirl or something like that. Anyway, they were looking at it and they were giggling and laughing and they were passing it around and it was going from table to table. And of course, as a new Christian, I was, you know, I was very fired up about my faith and told people, yeah, I was baptized. And they go, yeah, that's nice. You know, I mean, they didn't get it, but, but they knew something had changed in me. And that magazine started to pass around and when the guy got it and I was at the next table, he turned to me like this and he just handed it forward to the table over there because he didn't want me to refuse it and he knew that I would. So when an unbeliever can count on you to act like a Christian, that means that you are being strong in the Lord. Perseverance is also being equipped in the Lord. In verse 11 he says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Paul talks about the armor of God being truth and righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, the Holy Spirit, prayer, all these things. And he says that the Christian who perseveres does so because he knows what his resources are and he learns how to use them. The Christian who is strong in the Lord goes to his knees in prayer first, not last. That's the first thing they do if trouble comes, if challenge comes. Straight to their knees in prayer, not I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to bend it, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to manage it, no. The Bible and prayer and the Holy Spirit cannot help the one who doesn't read cannot help the one who does not go to God in prayer or submit to the Holy Spirit. You know, it's the same thing in your spiritual life. Use it or lose it. So perseverance is strong in the Lord, equipped in the Lord, knowing how to use your resources in the Lord and also being wise in the Lord. Verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. In order to finish the battle, the war, you need to know who the enemy is and his way of fighting. Isn't that what's in the news? Isn't that the big debate going on? It seems that the leaders in the government are not calling it the way it is, you know, who our enemy is supposed to be. They're tiptoeing around it. They don't want to offend anybody. All this political correctness, instead of saying, these guys are our enemies, we've got to wipe them out. You know, that's not happening. Well, Paul is saying the same thing. You have to have the wisdom to know who really is your enemy. It's not about just, oh, oh, I must not have sex until I am married, or oh, oh, I must not use tobacco because that's a sin. Oh, oh, it's not, you know, I mustn't get drunk. Or I have to avoid all the allurements in the world. You're on this treadmill you know, of just avoiding stuff. It's, it's bigger than that. It's not about those things per se. It's about Satan using these things and other things to draw us away from Jesus Christ and eternal life. That's what it's about. That's who we're fighting. You know, we get so tangled up you know, with the dangling carrot that we forget who's dangling the carrot. The war is not against drugs. The war is against Satan and to defeat Satan and his schemes we must persevere in faith and prayer and the gospel and so on and so forth. It's not about what you avoid, it's about what you do. That's the difference. That's the wisdom. And so Christ, he persevered through immense trials and attacks by Satan and those who wish to create the aroma of Christ before God must also have the ingredient of perseverance in their lives as well. So I ask, you know, it's like, it begs to be asked. What aroma is your life producing before God? 
Is it the aroma of sexual sin, words, thoughts, activity that is unclean? I mean, there's nothing wrong with sex in the proper context, but is your sexual activity, is it proper? Ask yourself that question. Is your aroma one of worldliness, like Esau, you know, a man so unspiritual he traded his birthright for a plate of stew? Do you smell like the world because you've traded your Christianity for the few earthly pleasures that the world has to offer, worldly music, worldly activities? You know, so much of the world, there's hardly any room for the spirit at all. Is the aroma one of chaos and confusion, a person at odds with everyone, family, friends, the smell of laziness or dishonesty, is that the smell? And perhaps it's the smell of fear. You, know, you can smell when somebody's afraid, afraid of being judged because you're not, you've not remained faithful to Jesus Christ. So I encourage all of us to cultivate the ingredients that will create the aroma of Christ in our lives that not only God can smell, but other people can smell as well. Four ingredients to produce the beautiful aroma of Christ. Purity of thought, speech, and action. Making spirituality a priority. Orderly living at home and at work perseverance in the faith. Not just avoiding Satan's attack, but going on the offensive through evangelism and teaching and prayer and faithfulness and service to the church. Take the battle to him. Stop playing defensive. Be on the offensive. It's not too late to dispose of the stench of the old sinful life and begin preparing a new mixture of ingredients that will come before God smelling sweetly and acceptably in Christ Jesus. I ask you, if you wish to take on this new aroma, we ask you to come and bathe in the pure waters of baptism and wash away your sins. Or perhaps you need to cleanse your conscience by being restored through the prayers of the church. Whatever you need in order to produce the aroma of Christ in your life, don't hesitate, don't put it off. Do it today as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.